The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is a Four Center podcast feed. I'm Ken Naps. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. And I'm Jennifer Landa. And we're here to talk about news, breaking news from a long time ago in the Star Wars galaxy. Also, celebrate a return and an actor uh, having a wonderful moment in the sun and hopefully more to come. And uh, this day in Star Wars history, going back to the 70s. It's all here on the show today. But before we get to it, I'm going to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player or talking robot car wherever you, wherever you can get this stuff you can listen to the books there so a little bit later we have our fortune recommends an audio book we think you should try out on us we have an ask coming up but i like catching up here uh jen it's a weird time in star wars fandom it's been that way for a little bit <laughs> uh, did you find a pocket of joy where did star wars find you i actually did not no i, I <laughs> no you know Okay. Let me tell you what happened. So I totally forgot about the Mandalorian coming out on Wednesday. Uh, truth be told, there was a, a teacher's uh, strike that happened in LAUSD. It was uh, also the bus drivers that were striking. So there was no school for three days. So my whole schedule was upended and I didn't know what day it was. Monday, <laughs> Wednesday morning, I opened up Twitter, not thinking, and I start seeing people tweeting about the Mandalorian and it was kind of cryptic but enough to where i i was like i'm starting to put the pieces together okay gotta close twitter i went on <laughs> to instagram and people were sharing the most obvious spoilers <laughs> i think that they thought that they were being coy they were not being coy it was so obvious and immediately the spoiler alert if you have not seen the latest mandalorian <laughs> episode ahmed best <laughs> is back uh, as well back we'll, we'll talk about that later but the point is is that i already knew he was back from what people had shared on instagram of all places um yeah and it was kind of shocking because this was at like i think eight or nine in the morning mm. and i was mm. like we all know like game of thrones house of dragon right sun or last of us sunday nights if you mm -hmm. aren't watching it people are going to be live tweeting that's just the way it is so i i avoid that right Right. But for this show that's released uh, at midnight or, uh, on Tuesday, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> or Wednesday morning, I feel like we've all kind of come to the consensus that we're not going to discuss it really until Thursday. It's kind mm -hmm. of how it's been feeling, at least right. when I've been posting videos. So I was shocked. I was really shocked. And I didn't really get upset or angry, but I was just like, ah, it would have been fun to experience <laughs> that reveal, like, you know, watching the actual episode. Anyway, so now I don't know. Now I just won't check anything at all. Yeah. But I also must remember it's Wednesday. That's key. <laughs> <laughs> totally understandable with the uh, the sudden uh, strike and having to reshuffle everything in your life. It's totally understandable to lose track. <laughs> right, right, exactly. But yeah, that was that was a little surprising. And people that I, I was really surprised <laughs> they were spoiling it. Uh, I, yeah, hmm. it's, it's been a thing now, obviously, right for over a decade since I think this that conversation really, you know, has come to light. And and and, and I, I I see people. I don't want to see even on all sides of the argument. I, you know, you're doing what's right, Jen. Stay off social media as best you can. But that's also not how life functions. We get news from there. We get updates. We get there's reasons to go there. Uh, so I think we try that balance here. Even our thumbnails or our promotions of the episodes on the day of, you know, a good redacted Joseph does great stuff with that. Or yeah, you know, that's they, great. It's a fine line. But a, a friend of mine uh, with the Central Coast Film Society I, I was on Facebook, and he he was going after every news outlet that was spoiling it that morning. <laughs> <laughs> he was tagging them. Hey, this looks pretty good. Uh, seems like kind of a spoiler. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> it's just like, I just, because it was in the morning time. He's getting up, taking his kids to school. He's he's not up staying up till midnight here on the West Coast. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. So I get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I really relate to that because we 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 make Star Wars a priority, and because I love it, and I probably would 
anyway, but also, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, we're talking about it the next day and, and it is a part of what, what we're doing to get by in the world. Uh, but there are other things I love that are just like I'm two episodes behind on Picard and it is not an indication of how much I love Picard. It's I want to watch it with my wife. And also, hey, our family needed things from us mm-hmm. and our jobs needed things from us and we needed to sleep, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and we needed to book tickets for things that were time sensitive when we only had one hour together that evening. And and I just <laughs> wish that people had more empathy for that. It's, it isn't always an indication of, well, I guess you don't care. It's, you know, right. yeah. It's there only so many hours in a day. And, you know, I, I, I try not to gnash my teeth as much about it. And just the redacted thing with the tweets is just like one of those, like, you know what? I'm going to try to be the world that I want to live in. Yeah. And like for this episode, when I wrote up the description for our discussion of The Mandalorian, I, instead of saying anything about Keller and Beck or Ahmed Best, mm-hmm. I put redacted. And as I was typing it, all of the trending topics were Ahmed Best, Jar Jar, Keller and Beck, exactly. <laughs> Jedi Temple Challenge. Is like, oh. this is ridiculous. I am, mm-hmm. I'm definitely walking into the wind on this one, but I'm going to keep <laughs> typing redacted. And you know what? I saw that and, and uh, yeah, that was brilliant. I thought it was so the perfect way to do it. And if I had seen just that, I would have never known. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. somebody showed up. Yeah. But, <laughs> but we were like sharing yeah. Ahmed Best photo and i'm like headshot and like i you know cryptically yeah. saying oh welcome back or something i'm like oh okay well obviously he's in this episode <laughs> yeah. and he's oh, playing cryptic. a jedi yeah uh, yeah, yeah. It, it devolves pretty quickly to this like you were going to say just this moral argument what side do you stand on and it's just it's it's way more simpler than that and more complicated at the same time like just I remember when in game of thrones uh you know season four uh the king goes and that's all I'll say, just because mm-hmm. I know people who st- haven't watched that series and they're re- trying to rewatch, <laughs> and they're like, mm-hmm. "Hey," um, and people change that to their profile pictures on social media. <laughs> like, <laughs> the night it happened, and it's like, ah, I know you're celebrating death, but uh, you know, it's just a weird time. Wow. Uh, to say uh, one other positive thing, I did see several people that uh, that we know, uh, friends of the show, and in other uh, Star Wars uh, discussion and pop culture discussion, mm-hmm. people making use of. Twitter at least has the like sensitive content, you know? Mm. Oh Uh, yes, that was good. It's usually a porn bot, but instead this time it was (laughs) Amen Best. And I thought that was, that was great, right? Because I do get the perspective of we're looking for connection. Something amazing happens. We just want to shout it out and connect. And that I thought was such a great way because people were like, they didn't put anything spoiler in the text. It was in the image. And then, and then those who were able to watch were able to share and didn't spoil that for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful stuff. Yeah. The, the, one of the great debates of our time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, uh, Jen, uh, spoilers here. <laughs> yes. Spoilers here. Uh, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, Joseph, how did your uh, busy Star Wars and life week? <laughs> it, was, it was a good week, busy week, uh, lots of stuff going on. You had a chance to talk to a couple different uh, friends about Star Wars. Great to get uh, some different perspectives. Uh, and all that, I uh, have a friend who is watching all of Star Wars, not only with his uh, wife, but also their friend who hasn't seen any Star Wars and truly doesn't know anything mm. uh, and wants to watch it in the order the story happens. Mm. <laughs> so that's wow. fascinating to get those perspectives. Like he, mm. He's not sure if she knows that Anakin becomes Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like halfway through the Clone Wars and like he's, he's, he's a nice guy here I really like him I hope oh, it turns out oh uh, so always fascinating to get those perspectives uh, kind of the big wow. adventure for the week is it was my wife uh, Sarah's birthday Yay. on Saturday and the one thing that she for sure wanted to do is go for a walk somewhere uh, but she didn't want to plan ahead because it had been raining, you know, and she didn't want to have her heart broken. So we're, like, oh, we're trying to decide at the last minute. Uh, and we had never been out to the the Vasquez Rocks, which is about an mm-hmm. hour drive from where we live. Mm. Uh, it, I think a ton of people who, who love pop, pop culture are very well aware of what the Vasquez Rocks are. But if you're not, uh, they are just these weird jutting rocks that come up at these exciting angles that are great for Westerns and look like alien planets. So they've been used in a million Westerns, a million science fiction stories, uh, very famously in a couple of different uh, Star Trek things, in particular the original series episode Arena with the Gorn. Uh, We've been meaning to go there for nine years. Wow. We just had that moment of like, we're trying to decide where to go, and like almost every park we would normally go to is going to be muddy because it's been raining. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And like, and they'd probably be chilly, and we're like, 
you know what might be actually be the perfect temperature to finally go to Vasquez Rock. So, <laughs> uh, so we did. It was great. We took some photos, put them on social media. Uh, my wife had given me for uh, Christmas a uh, an Etsy Star Wars shirt that said Tatooine National Park. So it's like, okay, mm-hmm. Tatooine was not filmed at Vasquez Rocks, but it's got the right vibe. Could have, yeah. It yeah. could have. They could have. Uh, so I, I wore that there, and that was really fun. And the the Star Wars part of it, it was I was wearing my Star Wars shirt. I was thinking about Star Trek and all the other things that had been filmed there. Feeling bad, I was not cut up on Picard, uh, which has filmed there. Uh, <laughs> and then I saw like there weren't that many people there. We, we ran into maybe you know thirty people across the whole park, uh, and I think I saw four different Mandalorian and Grogu shirts, and. Mm. All all sorts of different people, kids, you know, uh, uh, what looked like a mom, you know, just, a, you know, a 22 year old, you know, uh, yeah. out with buddies. It was a great reset to just remember that we do get caught up in the uh, social media discourse sphere. And it was just great to see, like, <laughs> I, I don't I don't think any of those people had strong opinions about whether or not Kathleen Kennedy should be fired. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> we like the show with the bounty hunter and the baby. It's fun. Mm-hmm. It's a good time. You know, right. maybe, maybe uh, uh, I'd be surprised, but it was just that, that scene that just remember, like there, there's a lot of people who just watch these shows and, and enjoy them. They like that one. They didn't like that one. Yeah. And that was a nice reset. That's yeah, perfectly leads in to where I'm going. Uh, number one, yeah, I have I have 25 years in LA. I've never been to Vasquez rocks other than what? to turn left and go take a Chihuahua to the boarding. <laughs> uh, range there that we go to. And I can tell you there's a, Great McDonald's off Golden Valley Circle Road. If you want, want some fries on the way there, um, I think uh, I think Kirk also fought a monster at that McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> it's got one of the double drive-in lane McDonald's things. Um, yeah, no, uh, uh, I'm right there with you. I experienced this thing. Uh, number one, rewatched. Uh, um, Grace had uh, a lot of stuff going on with her, and she's not ch- had a chance to watch Mando past episode one this season yet. So um, she had to say uh, stay uh, tied to a couch and recover from. Uh, something and so she said i'd love to watch we call in our house the baby yoda show which uh, (laughs) um so we watched two three and four um and it was great to to, you and i joseph in our reviews always talk about our our partner's perspectives and how that's really valuable to us kind of the same vibe of they're not in the bubble they're fans but they're not in the bubble Mm -hmm. and i right before chapter three i said honey do you want to keep watching and i said the next one's kind of long i said i'll just say this some some people a lot, a lot of folks. It was a little, a little different episode, and, and 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 you know, I don't know. And she was like, nah, "Okay." And we watched it. And at the end of it, she goes, "Why do? Why did people have a problem with that? Why is that? Why was that different? That was great." <laughs> <It's> mm. like, <laughs> I, I couldn't. I didn't have any follow ups. I was just like, nah, "No, you're right. You're right. Let, let's watch. It. Let's watch it before." <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I, I had to go. Um, I, I, I'm still uh, in, a, in a fantasy baseball league, combed with a longtime friend of mine, uh, and his uh, kid twin boys now who are 13. So one of those cases of, you know, I've known them since before they were born that kind of thing. And, but I hadn't seen him in a year. So I missed the draft last year. So it's been like two years and I walk in and star Wars Legos are everywhere. And one of his sons um, plays baseball. The other one's uh, doing more theater stuff right now. And so he was like, Hey, you know, uh, he really loves star Wars and he wants to show off his stuff. So we walked into his, his room. This is a 13 year old boy and Funko pops everywhere. Star Wars Legos <laughs> everywhere. And I walked into his room and it was like, it was the N1 Lego set with Pelly and, and, and that from, from Book of Boba Fett and Mando. There was Black Chrysanthemum Funko Pops. There was Boba Fett, Fennec Shan, and Obi-Wan Kenobi from Kenobi. Mm-hmm. And the, the, what, what it was was, oh yeah, I love Star Wars. And there was no, that, that, it, that, the refreshing thing we all need, and we've talked before, and you just talked about it, Joseph, but to walk in a room and not have to have him turn to me and go, why, why was the Boba Fett series hijacked by Mando? Do you know why? Why? <laughs> like, yeah, I love, I love Star Wars. And, and I, I, it's not that I'm not there for those conversations, right? It's not that I don't want to analyze why Mando showed up in Book of Boba Fett or, or wonder about some of the news. We're going to get to some of the news stuff, but after a, a rather fractured week in fandom again, uh, with even my, I, I, I've been pretty upset lately of just like how you talk about news and how you digest the Star Wars news is pretty important. But also, I got to understand other people's perspectives. And there's some talks of the unfocused nature of Mando season three, which I disagree with with all my heart, but I have to understand other people have different views on it. And it's just been a fractured week. And so I'm not saying that to be snarky towards anyone who has issues with Star Wars or has questions about Star Wars, but it is just nice to walk into a room and go, hey, 
Star Wars fan, huh? <laughs> and just that's the concept. Mm. I think, yeah, I think what I'm responding to in what you're describing, Ken, is I'm always happy to discuss what works, what doesn't work for people. Um, but to, to have a conversation where you don't immediately lead with the negative, I think that's what it is. Like, yes. like my lunch I had with my friend I was talking about, like, he's got some things that, that he struggles with and we always talk about them, but we always talk about what we love first. Mm-hmm. Or like, mm-hmm. hey, I really love this, but that one part bothered me. And even that to me is like, Ah, yeah. Now let's talk about whether that worked or didn't and why. But it's just that idea of like, I'm a fan. Let me <laughs> unfold my vitriol of anger like, of, <laughs> as, as the first thing and the main thing. That's, I think, what I get really, really exhausted of. So, yeah, it's great yeah. to walk into a kid's room and be like, uh, this is the Kenobi Funko I had to burn because the snow speeder was poorly executed you know <laughs> yes so true uh the, the, this is my uh boba fett uh funko to remind me that star wars is too precious with its legacy <laughs> characters <laughs> oh my god anyways but anyways that. that's my snark coming in so let me try to own it and let's move on there into star wars news oh here we go uh, look, it's interesting news. We're going to dive into it. As off, often happens here, we record something, we put it out, and and things change. Sometimes right after we release a news episode. So it's a little bit of catch-up, but also a little bit of covering some of the news that emerged over the last couple of days. Uh, headline reads, Lindelof exit Lindelof project. Whoa, we've got some inception going on. Britt Gibson as well. That's Justin Britt Gibson. And a new writer emerges for what we will now officially say, the Abode, Obeyed Chino- Chinoy project. I will say it right next time. Uh, Obeyed Chinoy project. That's it's It's her project, all right? That's where we're at now. Uh, I understood the headline of Lindelof. It's 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 a big name, but um, here we go. I guess Damon Lindelof just wanted to eat Star Wars after all. Uh, it's a wild week of rumors, uh, hot takes about the rumors, and the regular cycle of Star Wars news based solely yet on reporting and not official announcements, which is something big for me. I'll explain more about that later. Shortly after we discussed Lindelof's, I'd say, KG interview last week, it was <laughs> reported that the Star Wars film project still Still set to be directed by Charmaine Obeyed Chinoy, Lost, Damon Lindelof, and Justin Britt Gibson, most likely in February. So let's catch up on that news. Uh, again, this is something that we we say nothing official, um, but doesn't mean that this news doesn't exist or that this isn't happening. It's just uh, how we process it there. But what are our thoughts there, Jen, on this? I was uh, surprised because I had just said in our episode, yeah, you know, I didn't think it was going to work out, but it sounds like it's going to work out. (laughs) And then we get this. And as always, I was like, all right, let's just wait and see how the dust settles. Sometimes Mm -hmm. there's these rumors. No, they were clearly out. And it was it was actually not surprising if we were to go back and and read that article that we discussed last week. Yeah, he sound it sounded like he just was not overwhelmed, but just kind of like, I can't I can't make it work. Right. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, or maybe it was just like, you know what? I just don't. Yeah. So this is a very common thing in Hollywood. And and I, you know, you guys obviously both are are writers, you know, Mm -hmm. been in the industry, like a lot of people touch a script. A lot of people come in that we don't hear about in typical projects, but this is a Star Wars project. So every single person that's involved is going to get a headline um, because we all really, really care. Right. Yeah. And it drives clicks. So my, yeah, my thoughts were, I'm not surprised uh, mm-hmm. the, the fact that they're out and I'm not surprised that there's another writer on, that's going to mm-hmm. come in and, <laughs> you know, lead this ship to the, yeah. to the dock, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Their, their, their uh, exit departure, whatever you want to look at it, uh, is, is big based on just the nature of, but yeah, there's that kind of, um, I don't want to say it's an official saying in Hollywood, but I'm uh, several screenwriting books of my life I've read where it's like, if you get fired from a project, that's a good sign. It means the movie might end up getting made because they've hired <laughs> someone else to write the next version of the script. Uh, mm-hmm. the business over there. Uh, Joseph, uh, you've been, uh, I kind of, slid out of the writing game because you know i just fired myself from so many projects before I started. <laughs> uh, you, you're uh, in there pitching and doing a lot of good stuff right now so you're living a lot of this um right now but uh your thoughts on uh, the follow-up to the kg interview in our discussion <laughs> yeah i think uh, kg is a, a good way to describe it i think uh i think i got overwhelmed with my own hope uh mm-hmm. last week I, I think that interview did really sound like you know by the time he did say like maybe sometimes you're thinking i'd rather be uh, you know, uh, eating and cooking uh, when it comes to something like Star Wars. 
Um, I was so hopeful that it was just like, oh, he's he's kind of nervous about committing to announcing this in a couple of weeks. And and uh, yeah, the interview really did sound like he was like, yeah, I decided not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, mea culpa on perhaps being too hopeful last week uh, for me. I was really excited about the idea of a Lindelof led project uh, because of Kathleen Kennedy's comments about looking for someone who who is a uh, Favreau yeah. or Filoni like on the movie side that really wants to shepherd a lot of movies set in the same era and can give a big commitment. And and I think Lindelof did such a great job on Watchmen uh, really celebrating what makes something special, while also plunging into new territory and uh, shepherding it while also absolutely relying on other voices. So all those things got me really excited uh, about Lindelof. But at the end of the day, if he doesn't feel confident in it, for whatever reason, which we don't know, there isn't even reporting on, is it that he was like, this script is not exactly what I wanted it to be? I guess there is some mm-hmm. reporting on it, but well, yeah, I'm we'll going to take that with the largest grain of sand mm-hmm. uh, I can humanly possibly find. boulder sized <laughs> grain of sand. Mm-hmm. Vasquez rock size. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Large alien mm-hmm. diagonal uh, rock salt. Um but we don't know why why he and Justin Britt Gibson, are they like, we gave a stab at it and it's not feeling right? Is there a disagreement about where it should go? Does it need to match up with another script? For I, I at this point, don't care. Mm-hmm. Whatever reason for him, it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. Great. Then you should, if you try to crack something, you shouldn't just stay with it because you want to be with it. If it's not feeling right to you for whatever reason, walk away. You know, J.J. Abrams and, and Damon Lindelof have a little bit of a relationship too. And maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe like Abrams like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, they're not going to go easy on you. <laughs> 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 Buddy, just so you know, Lindelof, this, uh, yeah. this is, this is going to be a rocky ride. Um, who knows? Uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm disappointed because I thought he might have been the right creator to help shepherd a big thing but if it's not right for him then i'm glad he backed away then Mm -hmm. the other side of it that's like the actual news right and then Mm -hmm. (laughs) the news about the news the discussion of it um yeah Yeah. i just i i really look forward to focusing more on the actual stories instead of the constant behind the scenes that is a part of it but at the end of the day you know we most people fell in love by watching star wars and then wanted to watch the documentary right, right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and i i want to get back to falling in love with the story and speculating on the the story as much as we speculate on the behind the scenes i do think this is all super standard for creative process for hollywood it is so uh, magnified because it's Star Wars, mm-hmm. and it's a and it, it is a bumpy time. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. The history of Star Wars films are bumpy. Mm-hmm. That Rogue Squadron being announced with the video <laughs> yeah. from the director, and then uh, nope, 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 nope. Yep, there, there's no doubt about it. It's bumpy, but it's a bumpy time in terms of where the mm-hmm. franchise is at, where streaming is at, all those things, and it wouldn't feel as uh, as tortured if every little beat of the behind the scenes wasn't being announced. Um, mm-hmm. I was affected by by uh, one line in the Variety article. So like, it, it's not mm-hmm. that I doubt these things are happening because I, I trust these traits that confirm yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think all of these events happened. Um, I, mm-hmm. But it is important to me to say they were never officially announced because the the company is trying to be cautious they're not announcing this they never did announcing it and this right. article from variety says uh, you know uh lindelof uh, and Britt gibson uh, departing quote becoming the latest creatives to part way with lucasfilm after signing on to develop one or multiple new star wars film projects to great fanfare mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that exact line is what hit me like the trades made the fanfare yeah right yeah. lindelof didn't make the fanfare Lucasfilm didn't make the fanfare. Kathleen Kennedy didn't make the fanfare. And I think we just kind of, uh, I want to own that as a Star Wars fan of if I'm this invested in it, that it makes money for everybody to talk about the development process constantly, then it's a part of this cycle where where if we're going to, you know, stare at every, uh, if we're going to be in the kitchen while they're cooking, mm-hmm. you're going to see some messes while they make it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of where I'm at there. And I, I feel as though, you know, even I want to be even more clear about it, uh, even on my own personal show, I, I release something about how we discuss pop culture is it, it, important because it, it ties to the real world real fast. And this is where we're at, at right now. 
Um, I'm with you too. Like I, you, you released a tell all book of, of, of all of this, the making of star Wars movies, in the modern era. I'm going to, I'm going to read it and it's going to be my, one of my favorite things. I love kind of juicy things like that. Right. I've said often the, the war for late night with Letterman, uh, Leno and Carson is one of the most fascinating stories in all of history. I'm telling you. It's, it's so amazing. good. Yes. So I mm-hmm. love it. Absolutely. This stuff. I think though, in a way, um, it's all changed and it changed with solo for me. So we are talking about, we're, we're, it's, it's important that, that we engage with the art. It's what we do here. Now, there's other podcasts that deal with the news, and I'm not just talking about Star Wars podcasts, but movie news is their brand. So, of course, they're going to deal with it there. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it has changed. The game has changed. It changed with Solo. Last Jedi was its own thing. We know why. But even Rogue One, right? The reshoots conversation, all that kind of stuff. So right. people go into the movies with that more than they ever used to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. there's not so now solo was sunk for a lot of reasons in the public and i think it was if, if you watch the movie and you don't love something about it which is not uncommon for any kind of movie you you came out of that movie going well they fought they fired lord and miller and all, you, you're <laughs> talking about the news you're yeah, not yeah. talking about the art so solo 2 doesn't happen because we're not talking about the art we're talking about the business of it too much and we're engaging with it and it's almost like that, that's going to happen here. I, I keep saying this, as I said on my podcast, I've joked about it here. I'll try to be short about it, but it's like, if I'm in the kitchen, back to kitchens, and I, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about pizza for dinner and some scooper or press adjacent podcast reports on Ken's thinking about pizza for dinner, but along the way I change and have tacos, you, the tacos <laughs> come in front of you and you go, ah, oh, but pizza, what happened to pizza? And, and you're not even looking or engaging with the tacos I'm serving you. You're, you're, you're mm-hmm. wondering why I, I, I didn't go with pizza. And, and and it sounds silly, but that's kind of where I'm at when it comes to Star Wars. Uh, it, it, it's become frustrating. Um, this stuff does happen, but a, a movie in development does not mean a movie's getting made. Uh, two writers leaving is is so common. Even if it was because Kathleen Kennedy hired this director and they didn't want the director, and they're not getting that might come out in the wash. But this film's still happening, or a film's still happening. Something's going to happen, and yeah, it's been bumpy. Joseph's not wrong there. It's been horribly bumpy, bumpy at times. Going back to Trank being the first one. The, mm. he's, mm-hmm. I was at, sitting there in the third row of that panel. Uh, Josh <laughs> is sick today. <laughs> <laughs> Wheel me out if I'm directing a Star Wars movie. Yeah, so yes, absolutely it's been bumpy. And, and channels that deal with the news, should that's, that should be their focus. That's not our focus here. And it becomes frustrating when you try to say, hey, did you like Solo? Well, you know, I would have liked to see Lord... No, did you like what Ron Howard landed? If you don't, you don't. But that talk about that. Talk about that. And 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 this is spread out to so much of society. And that's why I think it's big for me. It's a little bit of a of a, a hand on the desk thing of of it's not a denial of the news. Um trades are real. Movie news reporting is very real. Uh going back to the days of Army Archer, right? Um it's a thing. It's a real thing. But how we take that information, what we do with it has has Destroyed our discussion and appreciation of things, uh, and and that's where I get frustrated about this. So I, you said earlier, Joseph, I kind of don't care. I, I, I I'm excited to talk about the next part of this news, but I, <laughs> until we're sitting there in London and they say something, I, I just don't care as much. And I think that's mm-hmm. even me three four years ago, especially when I was working on other shows. So Can- I don't know. I want taco. <laughs> Can you imagine though if if this if George Lucas was making uh, a New Hope, Star Wars back then? All the drama with that production. Can you imagine how it would have been covered? Oh yeah. my gosh, it would have, would have changed. But we look, we look at the final product as wow. It, mm-hmm. All those challenges happen. Look what's on screen. It's almost seen as like a positive. It's a triumph. Whereas I feel like people become so cynical and then they go into the film and they have all that background, that knowledge about, oh, this person was fired or this didn't work. I'm mm-hmm. going to p- sit there and pick apart everything I see because I've now become an expert rather than just like, yeah, of course, there's always drama when you're making a movie or making any sort of art. And part of the fun is seeing how it all comes together. And like you said so well, Ron Howard really landed that. And it's it's so much fun to watch. Um, it's such a shame that all of this talk has really overshadowed the work. Yeah. I don't know how to fix it. I don't than, either. <laughs> than to yeah. hug, hug everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a matter of uh, everybody gets to choose how they engage. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, being interested in it, being aware of it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. is to me fine. It's just, uh, did, 
do you want to engage with the story or do you want to turn it into a, you know, like, do, do, do you want to have a, a fantasy football league for creators? <laughs> yeah. Mm. You know, are you, are you approaching this as, oh man, I, I recruited Damon Lindelof. <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to yeah. lose points in my yeah. league. Like, it, I think that's the thing to me is like, I don't want it, the, the, the stories behind the stories are fascinating. They're valuable to cover all that. I just, it, it's the getting so gamified and like, I, I, I see some people maybe talking about the actual content of DC movies, but other it's like, are you, are you with Snyder? Are you with Gunn? Are you with, I don't, you know, Aquaman? I don't know. It's so much about the pe- sort of gamifying the people behind yeah. the scenes, like they're playing a sport rather than engaging with the art. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and ask ask those news people that cover the news who have the movie news. Hey, what did that what did that project mean to you? They don't have a lot of answers that I love, and I'm just being blunt about that. I, I just don't think it it just, it just poof, goes. I, I I did some more mutant this weekend, of you know the whole uh, Mando three is unfocused. Uh, yeah, you're, hmm. you, you're not, uh, and it's just like because yeah, you're more focused on behind the scenes stuff, and you're not you're not really focused on what's on the screen. Talk yeah. about him. Talk. About him. Yeah. I th- last quick thing for me too, like just an ongoing thing with Star Wars, I think has been true for almost its entire run. True of other things as well. Of clearly, it is beloved, but because it's beloved, people can get so much clicks and money from constantly talking about how it doesn't work. Like, well, if it mm. if it truly didn't work, <laughs> you would not be rushing to get out every headline possible because you know what people care about Star Wars. Right. Even though so much of our discourse can get negative, clearly it works. Clearly people love it or there wouldn't be so much, frankly, money in mm-hmm. turning it into something to bash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some days we just maybe we should just do that so I can finally drive a car built in the same decade I, I live in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the other side of the news out here. While the fandom was discussing uh, these two creators going, one was coming in and like you said, probably had been in for a while. Uh, Variety reported that uh, Peaky Blinders, th- my whole life I thought it was Pinky Blinders, I apologize. <laughs> Peaky Blinders creator Stephen Knight, also the writer behind Dirty Pretty Things and Eastern Promises, uh, Vigo What's Up, has been brought on to pen the screenplay of the Obey Chinoy film. No further information, no comment from Lucasfilm, of course. So, uh, hey, let's, thoughts on this. And and by the way, love discussing this stuff because this is uh, what flavor do they bring? What could we be expecting? This is the fun stuff of it here, and I'm always here for that. So, Joseph, any thoughts on what uh, Stephen Knight can uh, bring to Star Wars? And did you watch Pinky Peaky Blinders? <laughs> I have not seen um, uh, Pinky Little Blind- Blinders. No, I have not. Uh, <laughs> um, I, You know, I am not a Stephen Knight expert in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I believe out of his entire impressive writing career for television and film, I think the only thing of his I've watched is the game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Which I quite enjoy. So I hope there's a lot of quiz show dynamics. He was one of the three creators of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. So I hope this entire thing, (laughs) I I hope his movie is uh, Ray gets quizzed about the history of the galaxy. And has to to phone a friend by making a a forced connection to Luke to get some answers. Um, I actually don't want that. That sounds awful. Anyway, um, I, I, I do. The things that I'm interested in is it. he is obviously an older writer, a venerable writer, done a lot of different genres. I think that's really intriguing to me that he's done lots of intense action. He's done period dramas, heists, uh, romantic comedies. I think especially for Star Wars' big return to the screen, uh, I would be, for myself, excited by a Star Wars film that goes back to... Uh, the, the genre stew, the, mm-hmm. the, a, a little bit of, of everything is part of the charm of big screen Star Wars. I'm still all in for if they announced, hey, we're doing this huge, this is the return to epic scale. We're doing this big Star Wars uh, thing. And then eh, for a much smaller budget, uh, Taika Waititi is making a comedy r- road movie. Like, great. Or somebody else is making a, a horror film for a lower budget. I'd, I'd be fine with that. But for the kind of big epic return, I'm really interested in this idea of lots of uh, lots of genres. The other thing that grabbed me, I have not watched a, even a second of Peaky Blinders. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pinky Blinders or, yeah, or, or, or pipe cleaners. I, I haven't watched any of it. But uh, I did Google it. 
And uh, now I know this, that Peaky Blinders is a British period crime drama television uh, set in Birmingham. It follows the exploits of the Peaky Blinders crime gang in the direct aftermath of the First World War. So that was intriguing to me if the film is set in the post-Rise of Skywalker era. Mm. And if some of the major conflict is coming with, hey, characters have great intentions, but th this isn't this wasn't the alliance to restore the Republic. The Republic, the New Republic failed. So what is next? Who is in control of the galaxy and what conflicts are arising in that vacuum of power and confusion about, you know, society and how we're going to work together? And if we're not and what, what a perfect vacuum for crime. Uh, again, haven't watched a second of Peaky Blinders, but since that is the general setup, I'm intrigued if <laughs> yeah. there is an energy to be like, hey, the ideas we're working with are similar to the ideas of Peaky Blinders. Let's ask the Peaky Blinders guy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, familiar with the, the projects he's worked on in name only other than who wants to be a millionaire, which I watched every night, like uh, the rest of America back in 2000, <laughs> uh, dirty, pretty things, Eastern promises. Uh, I know, I know the famous uh, fight scene in Eastern promises, but I never watched the movie. Uh, but yeah, I, I love your take on that, Joseph. It, it's kind of the fun. We did this a lot with, with Andor, right. And it kind of, Played out as speculated just by the fandom in general. You know, Bo Willeman showing up like, oh, he does like hard boiled political stuff. Guess what we got? You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it does kind of work, but it doesn't mean uh, Stephen Knight looked, uh, he, he's, he's got some like comedy rom com kind of work in there too. So it mm -hmm. could be all of it. But if this is what, what he's known for and it syncs up, and, and I love this stuff here, Jen. So um, yeah, uh, take us into your thoughts on uh, Stephen Knight, the man behind Pinky Blinders, who was, I think, part of the uh, gangs in Greece. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I have not watched any of Pinky Peaky Blinders, but I will say that I have, I think about Eastern Promises very often because Viggo Mortensen's performance in that film is in, is one of his best, I think. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a really, really good. Um, and also, uh, what was it? Dirty Pretty Things. I remember that one as well. Also very, very good. And, they're both gritty dramas, right? And there's kind of like a mystery and where they have the protagonist tries to uncover the truth. Um, mm. That was interesting to me. Naturally, I think he is bringing, bringing a gritty drama thing to Star Wars, very much like Tony Gilroy, right? Another seasoned veteran of the industry. You kind of know what you're getting. Now, here's something that's interesting, because he uh, did an adaptation of Great Expectations, which just came out on FX, I think last night or the mm. other night. It's gotten mixed reviews. <laughs> uh, people are saying there's a lot of sex. There's a lot of violence. It's definitely not <laughs> the adaptation of Charles Dickens' uh, novel mm. that you might expect. Uh, but but there is some, not everyone is is so thrilled with it. So that is that is something that's interesting to me um, mm -hmm. because I know Lucasfilm is really trying to obviously have good, good press, good PR. Um, and I also think that they're being smart because they've seen where have their success has been. Rogue One was a big success uh, and or obviously. So I think that this film is going to have a darker tone and will appeal to an older audience, which is not what I thought the Lindelof project. I thought the Lindelof project might skew a little bit younger. I kind of feel like this might skew a little bit older, like, mm. you know, 20s mm -hmm. and up. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we talked a lot about uh, Charmin Obey-Genoy's background when, when the mm -hmm. uh, reports first broke in, in her history as a documentarian dealing with extremely serious uh, social issues mm -hmm. that I, I, everybody behind this seems like they have the chops to dive into in the same way Andrew did in Rogue One and lots mm -hmm. of episodes of Clone Wars uh, dive into uh, mm -hmm. social issues that are galactic <laughs> mm -hmm. but reflect things that are going on in the real world and I think maybe you know the way Solo tells you in the opening credits <laughs> that it is about uh, economic inequality um, mm. and in means of, of production and resources. It's, it, it, it is not subtext. It's literal text on the screen. Uh, <laughs> but because the, the, the movie is also 
uh, fun and it's so low and all these things that uh, it doesn't really sink into people's souls the same way it does when when you can't look away from it the way you can't look away from it in andor mm. and and i wonder if it, it will be a uh, i am intrigued by what you're saying jennifer where maybe mm. it is going to be a film that is structured so you can't forget what's at stake mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah which i think would be pretty valuable um mm-hmm. Pretty valuable. Um, you know, that said, and yeah, I'm with you, Jen, on that idea. And, and especially when you bring on someone like him. But it wouldn't it be funny if Steve Knight was like, oh, finally, I just really want to do a Wookiee picture. Could we just <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for this? Really love the holiday, holiday special. special. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, finally. Krellman, I want to bring Krellman in or son of Krellman. Like, it would be great. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but yeah, we'll find out. It, it, it's it's an intriguing, uh, you know, it's an intriguing pick uh, for for me. Uh, even if I'm not super familiar, but just looking at the resume, I think that kind of stuff does track. So we shall see. There's been more rumor mongering amongst those who cover the press, the press adjacent podcast, all that kind of fun stuff about the Star Wars movie plans and what will be announced at Celebration, which is, oh my gosh, I can tell you by uh, my stress, is very, very soon. Mm. Um, and all that, like I said, really makes a ton of sense uh, that this lineup, I'm, I'm very intrigued by some of these rumors. Um, but uh, I, this is one of those four center temperature checks we've kind of joked around, I think even uh, at going into Anaheim, this big what if of, uh, you know, celebration comes and goes and there's no movie announcements. What does that look like in the world? What does that do to us there? So, uh, Jen, uh, going back to you here, any further thoughts on what might come out of celebration as, as you cover it from the safety of your own home? That's right. From CouchCon. Uh, <laughs> if, if the script is still being written, I can't imagine that they would announce anything at celebration. I think that that would be very, very bold. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe they want to change the narrative. Maybe they want to, you know, show that they are in control. The wheels are turning. But, you know, not having a movie announcement is fine because mm-hmm. we have Ahsoka. And, you know, so that's, there's going to be a lot around that. Obviously, more Mandalorian mm-hmm. stuff. So it's, it's okay. I think it's okay. There's things happening in Star Wars beyond the movies. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I definitely want to come out of London with, with a picture of it. it, it yeah, I, I definitely do. And, and I do feel um, needed to strong word, but it, it, <laughs> it'd be, it'd be fun more than anything. Right. What fun, yeah. what fun to come out of this with uh, a movie plan or three pictures or Tyke on stage, uh, mm. someone else on stage, <laughs> a new writer <laughs> on stage, uh, hired that week. Who knows? Who knows? Oh, so, yeah. Uh, it's all uh, going to be right out there in front of us, Joseph, in just a week or so. Yeah, it'll be amazing when Damon Lindelof walks on stage oh and says, gosh. we all changed our minds. Uh, yeah. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it, it would be nice to have a film announcement. Uh, I think a, a lot of fans I know I have, I've heard and seen people say it would be great to feel like we're on track to the next thing. Um, mm-hmm. so it would be great just for that, for the sort of the, the, the excitement of building toward 2025. If all we get is the name uh, yeah, of, yeah. of a, uh, of a film, uh, would be great. That would be exciting. I think if the announcement was larger, um, the, the things that I'm most intrigued by is not who is doing what, whose film is still alive, who isn't, uh, that is all valid to discuss. But the thing I'm more interested in is the structure of it. Is it just one film that could launch a trilogy is mm. it multiple films announced set in the same era um or is it multiple not immediately connected films the sort of the structure of how they're approaching star wars in yeah. the cinema is kind of the thing that i'm most interested in if they announce one film or if they announce 17 it's mm. to me how they're connected is what i'm really intrigued by mm-hmm. uh, yeah i love that look on it too uh, without a doubt this is um even even if it's just one movie, it, it, it going forward, it, it, it means more, right? It, it, I don't want to say it's a new era, but you know, the amount of time, 2025 and 2019, Rise of Skywalker, it, it, that's a new era of Star Wars films, indeed. So uh, getting a peek into that is, is just exciting. And I, I yeah. just on that. Yeah. And, and if they don't announce anything, I think that will be a, a big talking point, right? Of Absolutely. Lucasfilm stumbles again, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> and, and not not blah, 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 because it's not a big deal, but because we've been trapped in this <laughs> conversation cycle uh, mm-hmm. for, for several years. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
in the big picture, right? If they don't announce the film at Celebration and instead it's announced, you know, on a random Tuesday in June, time will forget. The movie will come out and we will all react to the film. Yeah. Um, but I think the news is great. I want there to be news at Star Wars Celebration. I think there will be news about Disney Plus shows. Um but celebration, it really isn't just it's not a giant press release. It really is a mm. celebration, a place to just be excited uh, about Star Wars. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with, without a doubt, conventions overall, San Diego, of course, New York. All, it, it, you're, you're so right. There's this expectation of news, un- understandably, because that's mm-hmm. what it has become. But I, I, I don't think we should move too far from that. That that core at times. I, I, I'm, I don't even speaking. I'm speaking to myself. Sometimes mm-hmm. you look at a panel. You and I, Joseph, have been looking at panels the last couple of days, and it's like sometimes in my head, I'm like, ah, I don't know. I'd rather go get floor drunk because I, I just don't want to celebrate droids. <laughs> it's like I find <laughs> myself looking, wanting to go to the news generating ones. And that's just 10 plus years. Or I think San Diego with X Men and, and then Hunger Games also have exploded into, into something that, that it wasn't always supposed to be, which is fine. Things change and things change. And, and studios found, hey, here's a way to get people hyped and get our news out. But yeah. Temper, temper expectations sometimes is not a bad reminder. Mm-mm. Right. Okay. Any final thoughts on this big story? Jen, anything? You just want to watch the movies. Yeah, I do. We just want to watch the movies. But you know what? It is interesting because if the movie is going to be released in 2025 and there's no celebration next year, it will be a little weird, right? To not have a big triumphant. I mean, I was really expecting Damon Lindelof uh, to come out on stage. <laughs> I really, really was. There's still a part of me though, who's like you're saying, and he'll he'll come along with Stephen Knight, uh, uh, and mm-hmm. they can uh, go out together and Justin Britt Gibson. But it's all right, like like you said, Joseph. At the end of the day, the we'll see the film and we will all forget, and we'll you know discuss whether we love it. Or maybe there's some notes. Yep. (laughs) Yep. I guarantee you there is the 10-year-old watching Solo right now who has no idea that Mm. it didn't perform well at the box office. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. That's a new segment. Jen has notes here on Force Time. (laughs) There we go. Uh, We're about to move on. But Joseph, any final thoughts on this before we take a break? Uh, No. Love that. No notes from Joseph. We got no notes today, folks. And we just want to celebrate Star Wars and read Star Wars books. Uh, Another one added to my collection this weekend (laughs) that is on my table. Uh, We're going to do a four set of recommends, an audiobook we think you should try out on us. Joseph, what do we have? That is right. If, unlike Ken and I, you're all caught up on the High Republic, we are recommending Battle Scars by Sam Meggs. Uh, we are excited to read this one. We are going to discuss this one eventually. we got to get through the uh, the thrill of uh, Star Wars celebration, and then we will uh, be discussing that one. We will indeed. Download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash force center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash force center. For your free audiobook. All right, quick break. Other side, we are going to talk about Mandalorian season three, chapter 20, slash four of the season. Spoilers ahead. Be warned. Be right back. Welcome back to Force Center. We're looking at Star Wars news, breaking news from a long time ago or just last week or sometimes 10 minutes after the show. We uh, want to uh, make sure we have our Ask segment here. I got so excited about the news. I just raced right <laughs> past it uh, like a Jedi on a speeder in Coruscant. Uh, Joseph, we are, uh, you know, uh, we've been talking about uh, a lot of wonderful things, asking from our hearts and what is today's. Uh, we are still asking about, asking about, we're asking ourselves. Yeah. No, we are asking you, uh, sharing with you our mission. We are on a mission to make our Patreon more robust. We have uh, looked at our, our history and realized that it is you, uh, our kind listeners and supporters, who have given us the most consistent support. And we want to build on that so we can keep uh, doing what we're doing, experiment with new things. Everybody has been very supportive. Thank you to everyone who has joined 
Uh, if you are curious about joining, we've added some new rewards. Uh, there is a mug. There is an exclusive podcast. There is, of course, our Discord where you can have uh, safe and fun conversations about Star Wars. Uh, one of our biggest things is we are experimenting with Other Center where we talk about non-Star Wars stuff. Ken and I are doing an adventure through the world of Indiana Jones. Our first episode of Indiana Jones in the Perilous podcast was released last week. And uh, people are really enjoying it on Patreon. So if you want to check it out, you can join us there. And we're building to a goal of reaching 2000 at $2,000 a month. Jennifer is going to be able to make a new YouTube series, uh, adding visuals to some of her old audio episodes of just great investigations into great Star Wars topics. So if you're at all interested, go check out patreon.com slash force center. Yeah, check it out. Indeed, some exciting stuff over there. And and and, and what Joseph said up top is, is really important. We looked at uh, what makes us successful and it's, it's it's the love, support, and understanding of those who are uh, best. It doesn't mean just listeners, casual. You know, every everything helps. Every click, every retweet, every every download, all that stuff helps. Um, mm -hmm. But it's changing industry, and the podcast industry is going through some um, changes right now. Uh, we we realized uh, this is uh, one of our greatest sources of support, so we appreciate it there. All right, uh, let us get into. Hey, this is a this is a news story. It's a different kind of news story, but it's it's one to uh, talk about. I think the biggest. Star Wars news last week was uh, Ahmed Best. I think that absolutely is the place to go. And he had an interview that took place prior to the public scene, Chapter 20 of The Mandalorian. Uh, so that's a good note there. But Ahmed Best uh, spoke about bringing Kelleran back from Jedi Temple Challenge to The Mandalorian with the staff at StarWars.com. Apologize, going to read some quotes and then we'll dive on in here. Um, Best said he was asked to take on the task of saving Grogu by Favreau and Filoni, and it was their support that finally convinced him to do it. He expressed some doubt for a variety of reasons, saying, honestly, I had to think about it. I've been in the Star Wars world for such a long time, and my story is such a roller coaster, ride of emotions, so coming back to Star Wars wasn't an easy decision for me. It was something I could have uh, immediately said yes to, I did have to, uh, it was, excuse me, it wasn't something I could have immediately said yes to. I did have to marinate over it for a bit. I mean, I was excited. I don't think people really understand how much I care about Star Wars. Like, I really care. I really, really care about the storytelling, about the mythology, about the fans. I really want Star Wars to deliver. And if I became an obstacle to that, then I shouldn't be in it. I don't want to be bigger than the story. I don't want to be bigger than the mythology. I want to contribute. I want to add to it. So it took me a minute. I love that quote. Let's start mm -hmm. here. Um, Joseph, Jennifer, we, we're going to ask, why did the appearance of best work for us beyond just the fun nature of the actor's return? Uh, but, hey, there's a lot there, Jen. Uh, you, uh, you, you can slide in here and give us your thoughts on it. Oh, my gosh. What a what an interview that he gave. Um, so much to discuss. OK, so when I saw <laughs> his return, which I knew was already coming, um, the whole episode actually felt very kid friendly. That's not a criticism. Uh, uh, it kind of felt like the Mandalorian that has been the Mandalorian all along. And I immediately, I, my daughter was home and I showed her because she saw, she actually saw a gif of that, of, of him saying, everything's going to be okay, kid. She's like, oh, oh, what's that? And, Cause I think she remembered him because we used to watch the Jedi Temple series. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, let me show you the sequence. <laughs> Very excited. She was enthralled by that whole sequence with Grogu. She wanted the journey to continue. And then when it went back to the Mandalorian, she was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so the, she's like, who's that? I'm like, the armor. She's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I thought that was really, really interesting because it was a smart choice for the story to have this, we built up who is the character that rescues Grogu? Who is it going to be, right? And I felt like if it was somebody that was a Jedi that was much more well-known, it might have melt made the story feel smaller. Like, we, you know, the galaxy feels smaller. Mm -hmm. Choosing a character and having it tie in to the Star Wars game show is <laughs> brilliant. My daughter, I was like, do you remember him? She's like, yeah. It made sense to her. Like, this, of course, of course, this Jedi is having adventures in a game show and in the Mandalorian. Um, I just love that. I love how a character is a character, whether it's in a game show, whether it's in a novel, whether it's in an animated show. It, I love that about Star Wars. Um, it's just so brilliant. And I just there's just so much to love about his performance. But we'll, we'll talk more about it mm. in a little bit. 
No, I love that. <laughs> I love your daughter's reaction. Ah, the Mando guy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh gosh, gotta work on that. Yeah, the armor. What now? No, it all works. It all works. Joseph, uh, dive into that quote and more. Yeah, no, we we talked about it a little bit on our Mandalorian review, but this is really uh, wonderful to hear some of these things from Ahmed Best's per perspective. Obviously, mm -hmm. I really agree with Jennifer. I think it is kind of wonderful that uh, that a character is a character in Star Wars, and I think it's been clear that the Mandalorian uh, in the Mandoverse is embracing that, you know, from Cobb Vanth to Ahsoka. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these characters are, you know, to Black Chrysanthemum and on and on from all these different sources. A character is a character. It's all a connected thing. And Favreau has really been out there on, on his rounds of interviews about this third season of Mandalorian saying that it's conscious to pull from lots of different elements of Star Wars from legends to books to comics. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and... Uh, e even the highlighting of of, of the mountain, <laughs> uh, right. Umeit, you know, it, it's from canon, but it, it got such a huge feature moment in that first High Republic book that to me it felt like, yep, I know that's not where it is from, but that's mm -hmm. where my emotional relationship to it is from. Um, that I think the continuation of that, like every part of Star Wars matters to bring in somebody from Jedi Temple Challenge is great, to bring in a character from Jedi Temple Challenge. Mm -hmm. Um and to me, I, I think it was great that it was a wonderful surprise and it does have meaning, uh, but it was not a distracting narrative. Um, mm -hmm. I have said many times that I would have loved for it to be Quinlan Voss. Um, I know some people were like, what if Barris <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> escapes, uh, was, uh, uh, I assume, Republic prison and has a change of heart? <laughs> Um, or live action Gungi. Oh, I would have been all over that, right? Uh, the Terra Sanube puppet, uh, I'd be over that. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't think, uh, I know there's some stuff in Battle Scars, but uh, Sarah Junda from uh, Fallen Order, I don't know I don't know if her exact location at Order 66 has been locked down. So like, hey, that's a list of people that I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. But I would have been a little bit more focused on their story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because Kelleran's existence in Star Wars was canon adjacent at best mm -hmm. but what we know of the character is minimal mysterious but we know he's a teacher a caregiver mm -hmm. a, a protector and it's it just was so resoundingly jedi that there is a crisis and i am focusing on what i can control and what i have committed to what i have sworn to which is to protect mm -hmm the young uh i'm not running off to try to take out anakin i'm not running mm -hmm. anywhere else i am doing what i need to do which is try to protect these younglings so what little we did know about his story was just so uh resonant that we just stayed in that idea which is the idea of the whole, entire rest of the episode too of you know the yeah. parents protecting children in this cycle of violence uh so it worked with the rest of the episode and it worked great for my wife she she <laughs> she's like who uh she, i just, i i was watching her watch it out of the side of my eye when we watched it together and she didn't say anything other than being invested in the story and then when it was done she's like that guy's kind of familiar <laughs> i was like uh may i and she's like yes he's like so ah, <laughs> back. Ah, my best. Ah, yeah yeah yeah, Grace had uh, uh, yeah, almost a teary-eyed reaction. You know, Phantom Menace is a special place in her heart. And uh, just uh, she very warm smile when, when Beth shows up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well said. I don't want to cut you off, Joseph. Yet, in, in, no, no. In that. Um, but now I'm with you on it there. And there's um, yeah, a lot lot of we dis did, did discuss on the on the discussion episode this past week. And yeah, you know, Quinlan Voss, all, there's all these always great what-ifs. Gunji was one, too, uh, especially since, you know, the Bad Batch and all that kind of connection. But I, it, it, it speaks to one of the things I love, which is I, I don't need to just check a box. And not that any Quinlan Voss wouldn't be a check box. It could have been mm -hmm. something else. But it would have been like like you said so well. It then really becomes more of the Quinlan Voss story uh, that we be wondering. Not that we don't want to know about the Keller and Beck story because we mm -hmm. do. Um, but it really works. And and it wasn't just like the call comes to Ahmed and goes, look, I don't, I want to be in the story, not above it. And Filoni and Favreau go, Oh, interesting concept. Okay. They, they clearly came to this. Decision. I'd be fast. I want a Disney gallery just on this casting decision, right? Just <laughs> yeah. on the choice, this character decision. Uh, Cause it, 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 it's something that probably was in line with, with some of this overall thinking we have here of just like 
it's a character that would do this. It's a character that if we could place in there, because remember, the, like you said, Ken and Jason with, with Jedi Temp- Temple Challenge, Joseph, it was the timeline, right? We didn't, that was part of it too. If we didn't quite know what, mm-hmm. what era. but to go, hey, th- this works right here mm-hmm. for the character and for the story. It, it just, it was, it was perfection in so many ways. And yes, it's, it's absolutely about Ahmed best for us. But what you're talking about with, with Sarah in that moment, she's not leading with that. You know, and other people engage with it in a different way, and 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 I love that because even those that don't know, those that don't have Joseph on the couch next to you going, can I can let you know? <laughs> You're gonna now want to know, right? And and it becomes thing, and again, but in this way that isn't just simply. And I look, I guess I'll stop myself. There. If, if you don't know who Quinlan Voss is, you you might be in the same ballpark. But for the Star Wars fandom discussion, I think it does really work to say, hey, we're not necessarily focusing on him above Grogu. We're we're looking at Keller and with Grogu. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think before we move on to the other stuff here, there's so many wonderful quotes from Ahmed Best who just can, you know, just is a very wonderful uh, human being by all accounts. You know what I mean? Just every every answer is just so wonderful and thoughtful and great, and, and, and he's been through so much as we know about. Um, uh, what does it mean to us that Ahmed Best appreciates the mythology of Star Wars to this degree? Like you get that from the interview where he's like, "No, this is this is important mm-hmm. stuff here. The storytelling, the mythology, and what it does." He's a teacher. He's a professor. He gets what this stuff can do. So uh, that that got me excited. Joseph, did I, I'm got I got to mention got you excited? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of the people involved in Star Wars, he started as a fan, right, and and has a real appreciation for it. Um, I think he he is a storyteller, and I think that it's fun to hear him talk about that to talk about his love for star wars and his the, the way that he thinks about it as it's a mythology uh, here's what it means to fans right mm-hmm. um to me just such a key part of star wars is that it has a sense of discovery a sense of what if a sense of play and i understand because it has been so successful and it means so many <laughs> different things to so many of us it can get to be like something damon lindelof said of like there's so mm-hmm. much reverence for it like Mm-hmm. How, who who am I to add this new spice, right? Um, yeah. I I think that's great, and you do have to have reverence, but it's nice to also be countered with that sense of play and discovery and building. And I think that um, in everything that Ahmed Bess has ever done, from Jar Jar to Keller and with Star Wars to voicing Jar Jar in the Clone Wars, there there's, has to me been that sense of uh, how can we add to this mythology? What new ideas can we explore? How can it be in rhythm? What it, what has come before, but been a little bit different. So mm-hmm. that's what I hear mm-hmm. in, in what he's saying. And, um, yeah. and also to, to hear him, you know, wrestle with, I want to make sure I'm not a distraction. Part of what's mm-hmm. triumphant about it is it's such a star Wars story for him to be able to move beyond the hate. <laughs> yeah. It would yeah. be totally understandable if you said, uh, that's great, but I just, I don't, I don't want to, uh, the mm-hmm. the potential for the dark side is there, so I'm not gonna. Yeah. What what a champion of the light side to to say, but what could be good about it? And I'll mm-hmm. I'll push through and I'll find that. Yeah. No. It's a, that that itself. This, this again. This needs to be an hour documentary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of of he would be a, have a right to not want to do it. Number one, uh, have a right to be fearful in a way, right? But choosing to push push past that fear to accept the joy. And that includes 2019 in Chicago and some of our favorite moments for him Instagramming pictures on the street of running into people with Jar Jar shirts and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I, I like that too, I, I, you know, about him going, hey, may, maybe they don't even want me back or maybe it's too much of a thing to be back. And I, I don't know, but uh, here we are uh, with this here. Jen, uh, your thoughts on uh, Ahmed and the mythology of Star Wars? I, I loved that he cares so much and you can see it from when he first was creating the character of Jar Jar, you know, him and, and George really crafting, like mm-hmm. figuring out the character and he was trying different things. He's a very thoughtful person. He's a, uh, like you said, Joseph, he's, he's a storyteller. He's a creator. He's also a fan. So he's not just some other actor who's like, yes, I couldn't wait to be in the star Wars. It's like, <laughs> mm-hmm. Is this going to work for the story? Like he's thinking of it almost like 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 a writer or producer, which I think is really interesting. And there's also another layer that we've talked about, which is that I feel bad that he has to be so cautious because he knows he knows that if the character, if he or the actor Ahmed is kind of shoehorned in, right, Mm -hmm. he's going to get roasted for it. Mm-hmm. And and he doesn't want to have to experience that. He's protecting himself. And I thought that that is really incredible because 
he's a, he's a come out on the other side of it, right? And a lot of actors would be like, I, Star Wars, of course I have to do it. He's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it if it's not right because I'm protecting myself, my mental health, and, and I think that that's – that's wonderful, but it's also sad, right? It's sad mm -hmm. that a creator, ha that an actor has to think of that, that has to disable their Instagram, that has to kind of put their guard on in mm -hmm. order to be a part of Star Wars. And that that is a separate conversation, but it's just, mm -hmm. it's not with just Star Wars as we know, it's with all the, all, a lot of other franchises, but it's yeah. interesting because I was like, wow, that's awesome. And then I was like, oh, that kind of leaves a pit in my stomach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I have real world stuff indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, Bess once again took a lot of care in building out the character of Kelleran Beck, as he did with Jedi Temple Challenge, we should add. Uh, and he worked with the Mando team and costume designer Shauna Trippick uh, to incorporate his own tribal tattoos and Afrofuturism Afro symbols into the character design and the costume design. And eventually, he also formed his own view of the Force, saying, to me, the Force is not just this thing that the Jedi tap into when they want to throw something heavy. The Force is this thing that is constantly moving. You're always interacting with it. I see it as like if you're underwater and you're moving through water, this is uh, what it feels like moving with the Force. So trusting the Force means trusting these ebbs and flows of this feeling you can move uh, with, he added, in every single situation of this, I'm really trying to tune into this bigger feeling of the Force. When I'm getting attacked by clone troopers, I feel them coming. The waves of the Force are moving me before they even show up, so I know what's about to happen because I feel the wave and I can react to the wave. Same thing on the speeder. I can just feel the ship coming so I can react to it. He says, I, I am uh, really, uh, see him, uh, I see him really having a lot of trust in his abilities to surf the force. Water <laughs> and imagery of water is uh, important. It's one of our favorite things here in Star Wars, Joseph. Let's discuss Ahmed and Kelleran's views of the force. Because I love this ocean. You're swimming and you're going along with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love this. I, I always love these discussions. I, it's great to hear actors who get to uh, play Jedi mm -hmm. of how they reckon with it, um, especially with somebody like Ahmed Best, who is such a trained mover, uh, somebody who who mm -hmm. has, you know, to have been a star in, in Stomp, <laughs> yeah. which is, you know, what uh, one of the things that led him to being Jar Jar is, is that uh, physicality, that being in touch with uh, the the body and mind connection. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to get to hear him dis describe like uh, that relationship. It, it matches to me his description of the Force matches very much the way you know our our Jedi talk about it in in the main Star Wars films, right? Um, yeah. It definitely matches with the way it's described in novels. Uh, so many different writers have have had a chance to be in the minds of Jedi and sort of describe what that might feel like. To me, it even goes like what he's saying matches with Obi Wan Kenobi saying, you know. E e that you can control it, uh, you know, it, it directs you, but you, but it also obeys your commands. That that mm -hmm. we know that I think anybody who's been in water, even a pool, <laughs> yeah, right, man. of that flow. So I love hearing that. I love the connection to the kinds of movements uh, that he chose. And I I love playing video games, and I love Star Wars as a power fantasy. I've spent a great mm -hmm. deal of my life. Um, pretending to you know open doors and <laughs> yeah. uh, wishing i could will the re the remote into my hand um mm -hmm. right uh all those things are fine but to me that isn't the story it's not a smash the x button power mm -hmm. it's awareness it's connection it's something more so i always love it when actors really focus on that yeah, I love the flowing through it vibe. It doesn't mean you don't occasionally have to move something heavy or throw a rock at a stormtrooper. Of course, it's all, all all part of what we see and experience and the X button being smashed indeed. But uh, this idea of, uh, you know, uh, this is my interpretation. You know, you're throwing a heavy rock. It means you, you're, you're uh, ex exerting some kind of control over the force in the situation, which, if you look at it the wrong way. Um, and again, sometimes I understand you might have to as a Jedi. We got to see Keller in, in action here with that fierce glare on his face. But yeah, the image throwing a yeah. clone trooper off, uh, right. off the ledge. Great. I cheer. Right. Uh, that is a part of the fantasy, but I also yeah. like getting under the hood of the fantasy. Yeah. No, just swimming around in it. I love his view of it here. I thought it was really great. Jen, any thoughts here uh, on uh, on this side of it? I love this take. It actually, it helped me visualize it because if I was like, how would I be if I were a Jedi in that scene, right? It gets it you into your body. It ha You start having those thoughts of how you would move. And Jedi do kind of have an elegance 
when they're fighting. Mm-hmm. And, and that really taps into it. And I think it's interesting because nobody has really ever been able to articulate it the way that he did from an actor's point of view. Mm-hmm. And I just love that. I'm going to absolutely be using that next time I'm in a lightsaber duel with mm-hmm. my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, mom, you're flowing too hard. I'm, I, you're hitting me. I'm, I'm winning. Yep. There you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, since this interview was done before the episode, Beth said uh, this about what he hoped the reception would be, which of course means we need the follow up interview. I want everyone who watches Star Wars to look at Keller and Beck and go, I believe that guy. I want to follow that guy. Where does he go? What happens mm-hmm. next? I think all the best stories are stories that leave you wondering what happens next. So to us, uh, I think I know our answer, but but did it work? And, and what does happen next? Jen, I, I, we, we, we had a, Justin and I had a chance to really talk about what might happen next, and we're still got it right here. Mm. Uh, but, but what do you think? Did this uh, this all work? All the stuff Ahmed uh, was concerned about, uh, um, it, all the things we talked about, did it work? And, and what does happen next with Keller Ann? It absolutely worked because even though it was Ahmed Best, I be- I was engrossed in the story. A lot of times when you have a familiar actor, you can kind of get caught up in, hey, that's so-and-so in mm-hmm. that scene. No, not that was not the case. I really believed it. Um, and I do want to know what happens next. My daughter was like, what happens next? I said, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> where are they going? I don't know. Will we see the handoff? Maybe. Um, will there be more danger? Perhaps. But now that the character has appeared in The Mandalorian I and has played a significant role, not just a cameo, I think we will be hearing more about this character in who knows where, right? Novels, uh, comic books, video games. Who knows? The sky's the limit. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. The sky's the limit indeed. Now, a lot to... A lot to get to. And yeah, <laughs> chapter five uh, of uh, Bando could just be uh, Kellerin and, and Grogu. And, and I think a lot of folks would be happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. Joseph, pick it up. I know we discussed a lot here on the Mando report last week, but uh, your thoughts on uh, what Best was saying and, and what does happen next? Yeah, I, I love that uh, Ahmed Best is saying uh, what we often talk about on the podcast, the idea of the tip of the iceberg storytelling, where you just mm-hmm. see a little bit of something and it, and it fires your imagination and it makes you wonder. And sometimes in Star Wars, you just get to always wonder and there's never an answer. Or sometimes you wait uh, a week and there's an answer. Or sometimes you wait like 30 years and yeah. there's an answer. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is a part of the, the magic and, and why it's fun to continue to discuss it. So I love him talking about that of like, you, you just, you, you believe the guy of like, Ooh, mm-hmm. here's who he is. How does he have those relationship uh, with the Naboo? Uh, how does he feel that, that Grogu was the only one that he managed to rescue? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what does, what is his vision of, of what it is? obviously he wants to protect Grogu, but what's his priority after that? Is he, does he need to go somewhere else to rescue someone else? Like how will he cope with it? All those, those ideas flow. What was his life like before uh, all this kind of thing? Um, but for me, uh, we talked about this on the Mandalorian report. I, I do think it is meaningful that the armor basically asked Grogu to confront his trauma the, the the metaphor of you sit here and you listen to the metal slam as we see if there's any weakness in the best scars. We see if there's any weakness in you. What is your weakness? Why do you want to be a Mandalorian? What does it mean to you? Um, we didn't get quite to the weakness. We got the mm-hmm. opening the door and beginning the first part of the journey. So um, I, I'm not super excited about this, but I, my theory is that Grogu's memories will continue much like Din's did. Mm. And that Kellerin will fall. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe in maybe Kellerin will will leave Grogu somewhere. He hopes <laughs> he'll be right. safe. Yeah. So maybe the traumatic memory is Kellerin just fading into the shadows. I mm. I do think it might be Kellerin actually falling, uh, which then leads Grogu into being alone and unprotected, and connects so much to the the way that Grogu might fear to lose Din, uh, the way Ahsoka mm. brought up. Um, yeah, I think that might be why he, if he's sitting there going, um, yep, I am I chose to be with my dad. I'm choosing to be a Mandalorian. I'll, I'll figure out what that is. I'm a toddler, but I'll figure out what that is. <laughs> uh, and what I really, really can't allow to happen is to, to lose someone the way I lost that nice mm-hmm. man who took care of me. Oof, that's brutal. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, look, I, I think I hear what you say, Justin, too. Of like, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to mean Keller and dies or anything. They're, they're, loss. I think loss is the big overriding thing. But yeah, there's that, just some of those looks that Grogu has uh, to Keller and where I'm just like, oh, uh, this might hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, maybe it's left open ended. Maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, Kellerin is captured and they're, they're pulled apart and he doesn't know what happened to Kellerin. You know, maybe it's not as, you know, uh, yeah. awful as Ahmed Best is back <laughs> next week. His character uh, passes. Uh, that would be hard. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm so excited. Yeah. It's like, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. And even when we're talking the matter report, but uh, yeah, even now I'm like, yeah, well, I, I just I want I, I love a Keller and Beck uh, series going around trying to uh, you know lead into the path. I don't need, by the way don't need him connected to the path. That'd be great. But like I'm I'm just saying like him. This is what he does. That look on his face when it's it, nothing, there are no others. But also the look on his face when he turns around and, and the clones are trying to kill this child. Like that that's 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 serious stuff. That's real world stuff. And and, and it's pretty also inspiring to to see it in, in, a, in a Jedi. So I want to see more mm-hmm. of that. Jed, I, we're, we're dancing around this here, though, and I, we got to get your thoughts on this. We talked about it a little bit. I, I think it's more than possible. In fact, I even thought it was going to happen uh, this this flashback. That's That ship's from Naboo. That's the Naboo Royal Guard. Who are his friends? And is it Jar Jar Binks? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, I, I can't even wrap my head around that. I can't even wrap my head around that. What? Do you? What are you suggesting? I, I, I look, look. It, it could be, you know, I, we Padme's a little busy during this moment, um, <laughs> but maybe there could be something there. I always handmaidens, Sabe. Who knows? Kira Knightley could be back in Mandalorian. Oh my god! Right? Oh it could god. be there. Um, I just, I think I don't even know if I needed. I, 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 I literally had that thought when he's like my friend, and it's a, and it's a, a Nubian ship, and, and the Royal Guard. <sighs> That that the representative Binks was going to come down, and, and that might be too much, right? That might have been a step yeah. too far. And even even though I would have probably cried gungan tears of joy, um, it could just be a nod, right? To so, hey, mm. we got we got we got this guy. It's a nod, and maybe who's next and what's next doesn't necessarily matter to the story. We're going to go a different direction. I can totally see that. I'm not saying that this week begins with, you know, you uh, <laughs> back, and and I, I but I kind of want it. I think that's what I'm saying. It's I kind of want it. I kind of want. You know what? Could they do it where it's just like the back? You should see his floppy ears and maybe a side <laughs> profile, right? Like, so, like, just like, yeah, like I like a nod. I think a full Jar Jar. It, it that would take yeah. me out of the story just because, like, oh my gosh, they did. It. But hey, anything's possible, it, it right? Totally would. And, and when you and you read this interview, of course, I, I think that's something that Ahmed would might say. I don't know if that's right. Yeah. You know, like I, I told uh, you're all right. You're, you're totally right. But I'm staring at my Jar Jar being six inch Black Series figure, and I'm like, do it, do it. <laughs> right? Like you didn't say midichlorians. You got to correct that error. You said M count. I want Jar Jar back. Like <laughs> just, <laughs> just I, I've got to own my own. Excitement getting out in front of my feet. Yeah. Oh my God. I, yeah. I mean, if there's never anything else, uh, I do like the implication that as soon as the attack started, uh, Keller and Beck called somebody he knew he could trust because those guards aren't mm-hmm. more like, we're, aren't like, you know, hey, we just, we understand you have some sort of problem. They seem aware that they're there to help the younglings yeah. get away, right? Yeah. yeah. So yes. that, that, that suggests some sort of coordination, some sort of like, this is absolutely somebody I can turn to, you know? Yeah. It might be somebody we've never met. It might be Queen uh, uh, Apolna, you mm-hmm. know, uh, mm-hmm. he could be best friends with Seal Bibble. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? uh, but, but Jar Jar is there. Jar Jar would, would rescue a child. It, here's my pitch. I think that Grogu has some happy memories. I think we see Kellerin and uh, Jar Jar playing with the shacks in the lake country. <laughs> <laughs> like just yeah. and then I think we see a real sad scene of uh of Grogu and Kellerin uh at <laughs> Padme's funeral. Yes. Oh guy. <laughs> yes. Jar Jar winks. Jar Jar winks at Kellerin back. There you oh, go. Oh my there gosh. Go. I love that there. Uh, yeah, with the soca there. Everyone, everyone just meet over at Padme's funeral. We'll, we'll <laughs> Wait, but uh, now I want to see this. And now I want now I want Jar Jar to entertain Grogu to make Grogu laugh. I, There's yeah. nothing like you know kids laughing. I, I would love to see Grogu have a little chuckle at, at Jar Jar's antics. Now yeah. I want it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it would be an opportunity to do something different with Jar Jar, right? Jar Jar yeah. is a, a hopeful, um, positive being, right? And mm-hmm. heartbroken at what's happened, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And there is a chance to 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 show, uh, not grim dark Jar Jar, but 
to show Jar Jar with some sadness, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. You could add some letters. And you know what? Give give Jar Jar that beard that was rumored to show up in <laughs> Kenobi, right? A bearded oh. Jar Jar. Was gonna, you know, maybe, this, maybe concept art of this leaked out years earlier. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, no. I, but yeah, oddly enough, uh, there's some uh, like you could you could layer Jar Jar in a way we hadn't haven't seen. Though I think some some stuff in the Clone Wars in which I'm voiced him uh, in the mm -hmm. layers, of course. Uh, Phil Lamar doing the other ones. I, I think there are absolutely some stuff uh, there. I mean, Jar Jar has yeah. a love interest. Come on, there's more to the character. <laughs> Oh, in, in closing, Best talked about the legacy of Jar Jar and how the legacy is often not fully explored and celebrated enough and, and talked about continuing in the Star Wars galaxy in some capacity, not pulling the full quote here. But basically, it's the stuff that I, I think um, Ahmed's very right about, number one, and two, some, he, some stuff he said before of Jar Jar was the first CGI character to this degree, to this level, to this, this performance capture thing. Uh, led to a lot of wonderful things. Andy Serkis very much at the center of a lot of that, of course. But uh, for a lot of reasons, I think Jar Jar uh, in his uh, the character's place in that um, technological advancement gets overlooked. Uh, and this is pretty awful of, of, of Ahmed saying, you know, looking around, it's not just George. And I had to let it go a little bit back then because George, it's all about what George wants to do. Well, now there's more people making it. Uh, I'm a director now, by the way, he kind of says. Um, there's a lot of things to do for Ahmed. So closing thoughts on this, Joseph, and where would we like to see Ahmed best go in the Star Wars galaxy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it is great to highlight that that uh, truth of Jar Jar of even if, hey, the character has never really worked for you, you don't like the character, great. You've, you've never been online, you know, being super hateful about it. But even if the character doesn't work for you, a massive technical achievement, an amazing part of movie history. And in Ahmed Best is a huge part of that by bringing the skills he had as, as a live performer, as a physical performer in, into this role. So I'm glad to see that highlighted and, and people be reminded of it. For future, uh, man, I, I would love to see some Kelleran back, back uh, in uh, Tales of the Jedi type story. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, I would love Ahmed Best to have the opportunity to be involved. Uh, you know, m maybe there is a, uh, uh, a comic book uh, mm -hmm. run that Ahmed Best is involved in about Keller and Beck's adventures in, in the prequel era. I'd be really interested in that that uh, part of Keller and Beck's story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I know he's, you know, he's had that one man show that he's put together. I know COVID kind of derailed that a little bit, but I think it was back up. Uh, um, all that kind of stuff he's teaching now. He's doing so many wonderful things. But I, I, I just, there was a lot of, I don't know, there was a lot of intrigue in his words here, Jen, of just like, eh, it's a big landscape, a lot of things to do. Uh, the old Lucasfilm ranch these days. <laughs> and <laughs> what I could do as, a, as an artist, as a creative. Uh, there's so many things. What, what's your thoughts on the uh, legacy of Jar Jar and where Ahmed Best should maybe go in Star Wars? I think he has a lot to contribute as as a performer, uh, whether it's as Keller and Beck, you know, doing another Jar Jar type of character. He's such a great physical actor. Uh, he's so talented, um, but he's also a great storyteller he understands this process and mm -hmm. i could see him maybe working behind the scenes maybe becoming some sort of like producer i don't know about director maybe i mean look this all they they like to invest in their people lucasfilm does and when they see talent they will you know kind of mentor people look at dave filoni right they let him shadow and follow along maybe he could shadow some people and eventually direct one day or write, or I don't know. I think that anything is possible because he is so incredibly talented. And I think Lucasfilm knows that and they like working with him. And I think we will see more of him. Yeah. 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 I, I'm with you on that. Uh, whether it's directing an episode of Mando season four or something like that, that's mm -hmm. all that's possible or, or, or factoring uh, in some other way. Uh, yeah. Jar Jar. Uh, a Jar Jar story or just a comic in general, but I don't know, a, Jar, a legacy of Jar Jar comic would be interesting to me. Mm. Yeah, that'd be good. There we go. Any final thoughts there before we move on from Star Wars news, Joseph? Nope. I, I was getting distracted on the uh, on the Jar Jar Binks uh, <laughs> Wikipedia page. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are three episodes. Uh, there are five episodes in season one of Clone Wars that feature uh, 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 Jar Jar and uh, and 
Ahmed best backed out for three of those. Um, and and yes, Philomar under the uh, under the pseudonym BJ Hughes did yeah. the voice there. But then Ahmed best came back, which yeah. I just bring up is again a, a, my my final thought of just like I, I think he is a phenomenal performer and a really really strong person to keep choosing the love of Star Wars, the love of these characters, Jar Jar and Keller and Beck, uh, and choosing to to remain positive instead of giving into the cruelty that was thrown at him. Yes. Yeah. And it was nothing short of cruel indeed. Well, the future might be bright here for I'm a best in Star Wars. We hope so. But even if this was just it, uh, even if this is it, I got to say, it was quite a fun experience and still is. So uh, there we go. Well, let's look at uh, some Star Wars history. This week's in Star This week in Star Wars history, uh, we're going to look at Star Wars past on April 1st, 1979. Han Solo and Chewbacca race to Star's End in the Del Rey novel Han Solo at Star's End by Brian Daly. Set before the events of A New Hope, there were some constraints on what the story could cover. That meant Daly couldn't write about the Empire, so he created the corporate sector, which would appear throughout many legend stories before a version of it entered canon with James Lucino's 2014 Tarkin novel. And of course, the concept of the corporate sector would also factor into the events of Andor. Uh, this good, uh, book will go on to be part of the Han Solo Adventures Legends series. And Daly, who sadly passed away in 1996, would also go on to co-author many books with Lucino under the uh, shared name of Jack McKinney. Where my Robotech fans at? I think about 19 of them <laughs> written by Jack McKinney. Uh, what is our relationship to these Han Solo books? What do we think about these books uh, helping to usher in the expanded universe so early on in the Star Wars saga's existence? Movie comes out. We have Splinter of the Mind Eye, of course, and then already we're like, hey, we need more adventures there. Jen, what, what's your relationship to these books? Well, I remember seeing these books at Barnes & Noble <laughs> in the late 80s, 90s. Yeah. I never had any desire to read them I, because I was always more fascinated with what happened after Return of the Jedi. Uh, so that led me to like the Timothy Zahn books. That was kind mm -hmm. of more of, you know, Mar Jade and learning all about that. Um, that was much more my jam. I, I must say, I've never actually read any of these books, but you're, it is interesting. You're not alone. I'll jump in right there and say I I, have, I haven't either. And, and I've okay. joked here on, on the podcast before of I did get the, the the first two Lando books that came out. And, and they, I don't know when they came out. I can't remember, but I had them in the 80s at a library. And I've, I've, I've joked, but it freaked me out because I was like, where is everybody? It's Lando, it's the Falcon. That's about <laughs> only the people I know. And I, I just never went back to them. Uh, um, but I'm intrigued by these books because – the, 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 it makes so much sense. And I think it's part of my question too. Um, my relationship to these books is is uh, a little low in terms of reading them, but just like, yeah, more adventures with Han. That makes a lot of sense. It, it did in 79 and it does now. Uh, Joseph, uh, you might have, uh, if I remember, you have a little bit more relationship with a lot of the Han Solo books, right? Uh, I have not actually read them either. I think, I believe my brother did have one of them. And I, I remember trying to read it when I was a very young reader. And I think I was just a little too young for it and was like, wait, so Luke isn't in this book at all. There are no lightsabers. Nobody, you know, throws anything with their mind. Uh, it was like trying to kind of find my way in and remember kind of one of those books that sat on my shelves for years and years and years with a, with a someday um, mm -hmm. now my main reaction when I saw this, when I saw your, your great notes here, I literally just went, yeah, yeah, because, uh, I recently found a uh, star's end. I don't remember when I bought it. If it's the one my brother had when I was a, a wee child, I found it in my storage unit, brought it home. I, I brought it with me to my most recent trip to Minneapolis going, I'm going to read this. And mm -hmm. I just still haven't had time to read it. I opened it up and read the first couple pages and I was like, Oh, mm -hmm. Oh child me, you missed out. It's so fascinating particularly yeah. now that the rest of the Star Wars galaxy has been built out and the corporate authority, uh, when I was a kid, a corporate authority would be like, oh, I don't know, is it Han Solo doing my dad's taxes? Well, I don't care, you know? <laughs> nice. uh, now I'm like, this is fascinating. Love it. So yeah. um, yeah. desperate uh, to find the time to read it. Uh, my last trip uh, to Minneapolis, uh, I went to a, a beloved uh, a used bookstore, Uncle Hugo's, and, and I found uh, the, the Lost Legacy. So now every time I go to a bookstore, I'm looking for uh, Han Solo's Revenge, and I can't mm -hmm. wait to read them. Um, yeah. uh, the other other thing about Brian Daly is that he also did write the dramatizations of, of the original trilogy for public radio, mm -hmm. uh, which I did listen to. Uh, have like I had radio appointment viewing like I was a child in the 1940s uh, to <laughs> listen to those and yeah. uh, and listen to them. I have them on cassette tape, so I need to update. 
I also am desperate to find time to listen to those again. So Brian Daly, uh, very excited to discover his work and rediscover his work. Hey, this is what I love. This is that's this our honest relations with this stuff, and and it was a, it was a different time. You, you, we didn't have Star Wars podcast to tell you. Check out Stars End on Soul and Chewy and Star. <laughs> um, and, and, and I don't I don't I want to end on a positive note, but it, sometimes when I when I'm reminded of these, this is April 1979. Um, uh, the, so sometimes when that we didn't ask for Solo. We didn't need that. I totally <laughs> get that. But I'm like, that, that's always been the spirit of Star Wars and a lot of big fandoms, of course. But Star Wars, there's, I don't know, there's something about that. And even though I sometimes say I have a ah, I don't complicated relationship with legends, it, it doesn't mean I don't value them or just this. It, this is a reminder to be like, oh, yeah, no one asked for this in 79, but we got it and people enjoyed it. And the, it spread the love of Star Wars. And that's part of the value. It's also just about like how much age affects our journey. I love being able to hear from different people of different ages and how little. I think I, if I had been two to three years older, right, I, I'd see some people who are just a couple of years older than me who are like, these are some of my favorite Star Wars. I love these because they hit at the exact right time. And I was just a yeah. little too young for them. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Good point as well. Well, there you go. It's never too late to read Han Solo and Chewbacca at Star's End. That is our episode today, folks. Thanks for listening. You know, there's a lot going out and uh, going on in the world. Uh, dark times, uh, uh, tough times, struggles inside our, our homes, our hearts, and our minds, and outside as well. But we appreciate you climbing into the Star Wars bubble with us here. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod. We're on Instagram and Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. Check out our YouTube page. I just got uh, the next episode of Figure Fights uh, locked and loaded. So get ready Yay. for that this Thursday. Real fun one with a special guest. We'll just say Alex and Molly from Star Wars Explained. So catch that one on our YouTube channel. Their podcast available on ACAST, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and more. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. You can support us directly, as Joseph said earlier in the ask segment, on patreon.com slash four center follow me at catnapsock go to my website catnapsock.com for more jen uh, where can they find and follow you and all your hot jar jar takes <laughs> yes <laughs> you can follow me on instagram and youtube at jennifer landa tiktok at jennifer landa 1138 i'm going to be taken to the streets i'm going to start more doing more videos out in the world so <laughs> stay tuned mm. for that yeah going to maybe some geeky places around los angeles that's kind of my Ooh, goal love that. yeah we'll see love that. Love that. Joseph, uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, we'll see you in London soon. <laughs> you can find me packing and planning for London in my apartment and desperately trying to set everything else in my life right uh, before we go to London. Uh, you can follow me on all the social media at Joseph Scrimshaw and check out my YouTube channel. Just search for Joseph Scrimshaw. Do it, do it, my friends. All right. Uh, much love to you all. We'll see you next time here on Force Center.